Uh, welcome to uh, Libertarian uh, meetings. We meet here every month. Uh, you're welcome to come along to our other meetings. Today we have Sean Gabb speaking in praise of on John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, which is a classic in liberal literature. Uh, hand it over to you with that. Thanks, David. I'd like to begin, as ever, by thanking the... Sorry. Sorry, I'll start again. I'd like, to, I'd like to begin, as ever, by thanking David and the committee of the uh, Libertarian Alliance for their goodness in inviting me here tonight to speak to one of the best audiences in London. Um, I, I don't come up to London as often as I'd like to, and uh, the reason I'm wearing a suit is not from the utmost respect in which I hold all of you, but simply because I rolled up about half a dozen meetings into one day. Uh, I've decided to talk this evening about John Stuart Mill and specifically in praise of his essay on liberty. I may not say as much as I had hoped about his essay on liberty because I do have some general comments to make about John Stuart Mill. Uh, but um, I'll begin with a brief preface about who Mill was and his general importance. I would then like to talk about my own response to his essay on liberty, and then I'd like to explain why it has turned out to be less of a wonderful piece of writing than I thought it was when I first read it. So to begin, John Stuart Mill was born in 1806. He was the son of James Mill, who had eight other children. Um, he was marked out, even though he was one of eight, as the future head of the philosophic radical movement in Britain. And to that end, James Mill put his son John through what would nowadays be regarded as an education bordering on, or perhaps slightly the other side of child abuse. He started on Greek at the age of three. He was put onto Latin at the age of eight. Before he was 12, he had read Newton. He had studied several other foreign languages, and he had a pretty complete grasp of the natural sciences as they were known at the time in the early 19th century. He was also put on a rather stiff course of political economy, James Mill being a noted economist of his age. Although Mill did not attend a university, his final education was as secretary and sort of ghostwriter for Jeremy Bentham, who was um, a notable friend and patron of James Mill. Bentham, although Bentham was, I, I do insist, a very great man who is well worth taking into consideration, his command of the English language left something to be desired. He wrote in a peculiar dialect called Benthamese, which contained a mass of words which he himself had coined. Some of these have entered the English language. Uh, international, for example, is a Benthamite coining. Uh, but many of the words that Bentham con constructed were as meaningless then as they are today. Uh, and so Mill and a number of other bright young men in the movement, in their teens, were given the job, a most unenviable job, I might add, of taking a stack of Bentham's manuscript and turning this into something which a reader of ordinary education might be able to understand. Um, a good education, as good as you would get at a university today, no, no, far better than anything you'd get at a university today, and as good as an education that you could expect to have got at the uh, two historic universities at the time, Oxford and Cambridge. In his early 20s, as one might expect, Mill had a nervous breakdown. The information overload had just been too great. 
And as he emerged from his terrible depression, he began to realize that there was more to human existence than, than simply calculating the greatest happiness of the greatest number. There, there, there was something to the notion of trying to make yourself happy as well. And uh, Mill read Coleridge, and he read a number of other non-philosophic radical writers, and um, it deepened his general perspective on life. Now, Mill has been called the greatest British philosopher of the 19th century. And having thought about it, I can see no reason to dissent from that judgment. Mill was a considerable moral philosopher. He was a considerable economist. And he was, although he has been somewhat sneered at ever since A.J. Eyre set to work on him 80 years ago, he was a considerable um, philosopher in the pure sense. Mill was a radical empiricist in the tradition of Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. Mill had a particular dislike of German philosophy, Kant, Hegel, or all those other people, um, masses and masses of formidable words that I suppose Nico might have written the original. No? No? Very few people do, I think. Um, I'm told that Kant makes better sense in English translation than the German original, which says something about him. But um, the very name Kant and the briefest acquaintance with his works, which is what most people ever get, was enough to establish the idea of intuitionism as a viable philosophical approach. The, the, the idea that simply by taking thought about the world, you could understand it. You, you, could, um, you could come up with a number of self-evident axioms, and from that you could derive actual knowledge about the world. Hume it, ha it had been thought that Hume had dispatched that view of things quite nicely in the 18th century, but it came back with Kant and had quite an impression on England, especially through people like Carlyle. <clears throat> Mill, as I said, was a radical empiricist. He said that all knowledge comes via the senses, and his approach to dealing with the standard objection to this, i.e. mathematics and logic, was to say that the truths of mathematics and of logic were themselves empirical truths, that they were generalizations from experience. I'm not sufficiently well read in the debate over Mill's uh, system of logic to be able to give an, intellectual, a, a, an intellectually deep account of what he said, but I do find it rather interesting that the notion that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is neither a mere relationship of ideas nor a synthetic a priori truth, but a truth based on prior observation. It is an interesting point which I may be inclined to believe, at least I would be had I bothered thinking about it sufficiently. I now turn to... Mill's work on liberty, which he did not at the time consider to be his most important work, but it is the single work that remains a bestseller. It, it is not simply studied in philosophy, in universities. It is a popular work. You go into a branch of Waterstones, or even a Smith's in some places, and you can find copies of Mill's essay on liberty. It has had a tremendous and continuing intellectual impact ever since it was first published in 1859. Um, it has not had such a tremendous influence as some of us might wish, as indeed all of us might wish, but during the arid years of the early and middle 20th century, 
when classical liberalism was firmly out of uh, fashion. Mill's essay on liberty was still read, and the arguments in that essay had to be seriously considered at the, in, uh, at the universe, at the academic level rather, and at the political level. I do suspect that the essay on liberty had a considerable impact on the liberalization through which we lived in the 1960s and 70s. Conservative politicians in the 1980s felt obliged to pay at least lip service to it. And now that we are entering another dark age for libertarianism, the essay on liberty may well be the single work that sustains us through to the next revival. I read the essay on liberty when I was 17. Many libertarians are brought over by Ayn Rand or Murray Rothbard, mostly by Ayn Rand. I, I read Mill, I read, S, I read the essay on liberty when I was 17. And it went off in my head like a bomb. Which brings me to one of the observations I often make, that libertarians are seldom converted. They are simply made aware of a predisposition. Libertarians come out. They are not made. And there was nothing in the essay on liberty that I found shocking. Nothing that I said to myself, I, I need to sit down and consider this. I read the essay on liberty when I was 17, and I was not converted on the spot. I simply told myself, this is what I have always believed. I may not have been able to express it in words, but this is what I have always believed. And obviously I have read a great deal more than Mill, and I have formed a, I have formed what I think is a more balanced view of Mill, but Mill was the occasion for my realizing that I was a libertarian. So what, what do I like about the essay on liberty? What I like is his insistence on civilized toleration. I would like to be like Mill. Mill was a man who had reached his conclusions after long and careful thought, but even so was willing to accept that he might be wrong and was always willing to give proper consideration to the other side in a debate. I may not always have lived up to that ideal, but it is an ideal to which I have always aspired. I have always been willing to consider that I am wrong. Indeed, now that I'm growing old, I realize that I have changed my opinion on a number of issues over the years, in which case I must at some point have been wrong. I, I may be wrong now, I may have been wrong then, I may have been wrong then and wrong now, but I can't have been right then and right now. And so the mere fact of having lived long enough to have changed my mind brings me to an awareness of the need for a certain intellectual modesty. It doesn't matter what degree of enthusiasm with which you may hold a particular opinion. There is always the chance that you are wrong and there is always the chance that you will realize at some point in the future that you are wrong. And, and that is something that I think I have taken from Mill. Mill was, Mill is an intellectual <coughs> hero, regardless of what else I may say about him this evening. I've always regarded Mill's defense of freedom of speech as unshakable. If you ban, sorry, let me start again. We cannot be completely certain of the truth of any proposition. Of course, if you are a committed follower of Ayn Rand, you will argue back to me that uh, truth is easily discovered, and the only reason why most people do not accept the truth is that they are fools or villains. 
But if you are an empiricist, you must accept that you cannot be completely certain of the truth of any proposition. Therefore, you should allow and even welcome challenge to even the most solidly based propositions. You should allow and even welcome dissent from even the most disreputable sources. Indeed, if you ban any particular opinion, there are two adverse consequences. The first adverse consequence is the most obvious, that the opinion is actually right. For example, in the early 17th century, that the Roman Catholic Church leaned on, I will uh, gladly admit, you know, I, I will willingly admit the church would leaned on, it did, not, it, it did not act entirely of its own motion. But in the early 17th century, the Roman Catholic Church made it a heresy to believe that the earth was in orbit around the sun. Now, if you ban a proposition, there is the possibility that it is a true proposition. It, it doesn't matter how unlikely the proposition sounds to you, it doesn't matter how offensive you find the proposition, it is always possible that you are suppressing the truth, in which case you and the society over which you preside will be robbed of the benefit of that particular truth. The second, the second adverse consequence of any kind of censorship is that the opinion you are banning is indeed false. But then, what you are doing is you are turning the truth from a set of propositions which must defend themselves continually from attack and which must impress themselves on every generation by the mere fact of defending them into a dogma. If, for example, it were to become a criminal offence to deny that the Earth orbits the Sun, what would that do to the trust we give to the astronomers? Supposing flat earthers were hauled off to prison, supposing people who asked embarrassing questions about the orbit of the moon were to lose their jobs and be, um, and be turned into such lepers that their own mothers were frightened to be seen having lunch with them. Would that advance the cause of human understanding by an inch? No, it wouldn't. It would turn truth into dogma. And so Mill's point on freedom of speech is that everything, no matter how unlikely, no matter how offensive, must be allowed. And Mill went slightly further. He said that, uh, of course, there are many people who say that, yes, yes, all sides must be heard, but dissenting opinions must be put with moderation. We cannot allow extreme utterances, provocations, insults. That, that goes beyond freedom of speech. And Mill said, well, it is very difficult to draw the line between a vigorous statement of an opinion and the giving of offence. And in practice, offence is only taken by those who hold the received opinions. And so laws which seek to control the extreme utterance of any opinion tend only to be enforced against the holders of dissenting opinions. It would be much better not to have any laws governing the mode of expressing an opinion. No censorship in the sense of banning an opinion, no censorship regarding the manner of expressing an opinion. I read that when I was 17. I realized on the spot that I believed it, and I still believe it nearly 40 years later. I find it a completely <coughs> unshakable defense of freedom of speech. I've been called a racist. I've had beer glasses thrown at me, not for many years, mind you. But that is what I believe. There should be no controls of any kind on the expression of an opinion. 
What else do I like about Mel? His social liberalism. Mill does not simply believe that we should have the right to sit around as in some idealized university common room sharing opposing opinions about the world. He believes that people should be, should be allowed to live as they please, and not on the grounds of some natural right to be yourself, not on the grounds of some rather sickly PC mantra about the value of diversity. Though, um, as a brief digression, when PC liberals talk about diversity, what they mean is white people, black people, brown people, yellow people, um, persons of size, persons of diminished growth, persons of um, different differentitude, all expressing the same stupid leftist opinions. What Mill meant by diversity was diversity. Do you want to be a nudist? Be a nudist. Do you want to be a vegetarian? Be a vegetarian. Do, do, do you want to be a national socialist, bringing your children up in a racially pure commune? Bring your children up in a racially pure commune. You do as you like. As long as you don't um, get in other people's way, uh, a matter I'll come on to shortly, you do it. The reason for allowing all of the, the reason for allowing and tolerating and indeed welcoming diversity is not simply because you have a natural right to be yourself, but because it promotes the progress of humanity. Mill spoke about experiments in living. It is only by watching people do things and benefit from them or suffer from them, that we ourselves are able to decide our own lives. It may be that you like the idea of having um, indiscriminate sex with strangers, all male sex with strangers, to which Mill would have said, okay, you do it. It's your body, you do as you please. And Mill would have watched, interested, <laughs> now, I thought that we had got over that sort of sniggering. You know, I, I could understand it when I was 15 at school because we were in the middle of the permissive society where if a teacher mentioned the word breast, it would break down and help the sniggering. But we're living in a hello, we're living in a post permissive age. You're not supposed to snigger at such. Um, <laughs> That's a so why do you tell them? <laughs> 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 yeah. Are people free to sneak? <laughs> oh, of course. I, 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 I would defend to the death your right to sneak. <laughs> now, um, sorry. Experiments in living. It is only by observing what other people do that we can know if it's any good. And quite often the things that people do, although they may be denounced as indecent, as blasphemous, as deeply unwise, it, it may be that those turn out to be a better way of living. In, in which case, the rest of us may adopt those ways or we may accommodate ourselves closer to those ways. And you, you cannot tell what is a better way of living simply by talking about it. You need to see people put it into practice. Um, where education is concerned, you need to see the effects of what is called uh, permissive education. You need to see the effects of home education. You need to see the effects of, uh, of state schooling. You need to see the effects of a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand different experiments. Some people, I regret to say, will go wrong. That is inevitable. But some of those diverse experiments in living will be of permanent value to us and we shall all be the poorer if we are simply forced into the same mould decided by the authorities even if the authorities are acting with the very best of possible intentions. Which brings me to another of Mill's, uh, another point in Mill 
that, that has always profoundly impressed me. Where is it? Here we are. Mill is saying at the end of his essay that arguments for the protection of people or arguments for providing services to people may seem a good idea, but they are in fact a bad idea. He goes through the usual arguments that most attempts by the state to help us do not work. It, 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 we can do things better for ourselves than the state can do them for us. And, and then we come to a well, always regarded as the most remarkable passage, which I'll read to you in full. The third and most cogent reason for restricting the interference of government is the great evil of adding unnecessarily to its power. <clears throat> Every function superadded to those already exercised by the government causes, causes its influence over hopes and fears to be more widely diffused and converts more and more the active and ambitious part of the public into hangers-on of the government, or of some party which aims at becoming the government. Uh, and then we come to the killer phrase. If the roads, the railways, the banks, the insurance offices, the great joint stock companies, the universities and the public charities were all of them branches of the government, if in addition the municipal corporations and local boards with all that now devolves on them became departments of the central administration. If the employees of all those different enterprises were appointed and paid by the government and looked to the government for every rise in life, not all the freedom of the press and popular constitution of the legislature would make this or any other country free otherwise than in name. And the evil would be greater the more efficiently and scientifically the administrative machinery was constructed. Even if the government acts with the very best of intentions, and even if the government is more efficient and more humane than we by ourselves might be, government interference in the life of the nation is still something to be resisted, and rejected. It comes at the end of his essay on liberty and is a most impressive passage, I would suggest. What is, what is perhaps wrong with Mill? What, what is perhaps wrong with his essay on liberty? There, there are two objections, two of them connected with his, with his essay on liberty, the other connected with Mill's general politics. And because of the immense regard that I still have for Mill, I, I do offer these with a certain modesty. <clears throat> but they do seem to me inescapable. The first is that in his essay on liberty, Mill regards the tyranny of the majority as the main threat to freedom. Mill no longer... Mill was, of course concerned about the machinations of special interest groups who were or were close to the government. These had always been a problem and have been a problem ever since. But what Mill worried about more was that a democrat, an increasingly democratic constitution would allow politicians to say, we are the people. We represent the people, we are the people. Therefore, in making this law, we are not tyrannizing over anyone. We are simply, um, we, we're simply doing the bidding of our constituents. And Mill was worried that the people would go along with this. He was um, eager in the debates over the 1866 and 1867 reform bills to make sure that the educated middle classes of this country continued to have a prime share of the influence of the government. Fancy franchises, double votes, extra members of parliament and so on. The, the, the purpose was to allow the ordinary people, the hoi polloi, some say in the government of the country, but to make sure that they're ignorant they're uneducated, 
their savage voices should not predominate over those of educated, civilized men like himself, or indeed educated, civilized men and women like himself. It's now 150 years on, and I do not think that our problem is or ha ever has been the tyranny of the majority. Most of the bad laws under which we live have not, nor ever have been, demanded by the overwhelming majority of working class electors. Uh, an example I'd like to give is the laws regarding homosexual acts. I do not believe that there was a majority of people in favour of abolishing the death penalty for buggery in 1861 and commuting it to um, 10 years imprisonment. I do not believe there was a majority of the uh, British population in favour of um, making indecent acts between men illegal in 1885. I do not believe that there was a majority of the population in favour of strictly enforcing those laws in the 1940s and 50s. I do not believe that there was a majority in favour of decriminalising homosexual acts between men in 1967. And I do not think that there what is a majority at the moment for giving homosexuals the various privileges that they have obtained during the past 10 years. I do not think that the, the overwhelming majority of people in this country are horrified by the thoughts of homophobia or transphobia or anything else. I, I think that the general opinion of the majority on these matters has been one of total indifference. The laws against homosexuality were obtained by small, unrepresentative, but very well organized minorities. Their enforcement was procured by the same means. Their repeal by the same means, though this time the small, organized minorities were of a different kind. And the current privileges in which it is a criminal offense not to bake the cake for a gay wedding. That also is a law procured by the machinations of small and unrepresentative minorities. And if you look at virtually any other bad law that have been made in the past 150 years, these are hardly ever made on the demands of the great and overwhelming majority of the British population. They have always been demanded and obtained and enforced by small, unrepresentative minorities, indeed by the very people whom Mill himself regarded as the watchdogs of freedom by the educated, civilized middle classes. I, I regard that as a serious defect in Mill's essay on liberty. The second defect is his definition of freedom. Let me, um, let, let, let me read to you um, his argument. Let me just find it in a review essay I wrote some years ago. Ah, here we are. It comes in the first chapter. The object of this essay is to assert one very simple principle as entitled to govern absolutely the dealings of society with the individual in the way of compulsion and control. Whether the means used be physical force or the form of legal penalties or the moral coercion of public opinion. And this simple principle? That the sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. That the only purpose for which power can be rightly exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. It's hard to disagree with that. The only reason why laws should ever be made to compel people is for the protection of others, is to prevent harm to others. In the very loose sense, I don't think any of us would dispute that. 
The problem is that you can ask, well, what do you mean by harm? I remember 25, 26 years ago now, when uh, Muslims took the satanic verses to court. They said that this work had caused them so much pain and suffering that it was worse than killing their firstborn. It was worse than chopping off their right hands at the wrist. This was harm, and they, de they deserved to be protected from such utter blasphemy. It would be worse if they'd read it. Yes, I never did read it, but you see, the nice thing is that if you defend freedom of speech, you don't need to read the things you defend. <laughs> it's only if you attack it that you're required to look at it. You know, poor Mary Whitehouse, she had to look at all those videos. Didn't she? <laughs> I believe that um, Sebastiani, a particularly crap film by Derek Jarman, um, I, I did watch it many years ago and thought, jeez, but never mind. Mary Whitehouse videoed it, and she kept skipping backwards and forwards through it, looking at all the, um, looking at all the penises, looking at all the kisses, and getting a translation of the Latin. Yes, poor Mary. <laughs> Whereas all I had to do was say, well, you know, I don't care. Sorry. Um, um, you know, the problem with Mill's definition is, what do you mean by harm? Y you can stretch the uh, definition of harm in any direction. You know, Bob, if you get up and walk out of this room saying, Sean, you're a bloody bore, I'm going home, you are harming me. Uh, I should be able to get the police to drag you back into the room and force you to sit down and stand behind you with the hands on your shoulders. I've done enough. It's <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because to do otherwise would be to do harm to me. I have a sense of duty. I I'm not going to the bar yet. Okay. If, um, if an employer decides to get rid of some workers and replace them with a machine, that is doing harm to them. Um, it, there are just so many ways in which you can stretch the definition of harm. <clears throat> Mill was not naive, and he realised that this could be done. It's just that as you go through the relevant 30 or 40 pages in his essay on liberty, in which he says, no, harm, you know, this is not harm, or rather this is harm, but it's not actionable harm, you realise that although Mill, of course, is broadly right, and although he is right to shut down the various objections, the very stretching of harm, he is not asserting one simple principle. What he is doing is laying down a broad general principle which is only given liberal meaning by a great deal of further argument, which I think weakens the impact of his essay. And it still weakens those people who say, well, freedom, you know, it's a right to do anything that doesn't harm others, because you immediately open yourself to the counterattack. Well, you know, if I know that my neighbors are practicing birth control, it makes me feel really bad about myself. So. Mill would surely agree to having the police break in uh, and take their condoms away from them. And I'm afraid such arguments have been put. Uh, certainly Mary Whitehouse with her claims about the harm to others caused by pornography. They may have been false arguments, but uh, she, she, she was no fool was Mary Whitehouse. She'd read her Mill, or she'd read books about Mill, and she knew how to play around with the meaning of words. Third objection to Mill, and here I'm coming to the end. A general objection. Mill's worry about the government was not that it would be run by someone like Vlad the Impaler or um, Genghis Khan. His fear of government, his fear of the British state, was that it would be run by civilised, humane people who knew what was good for the people better than the people knew for themselves. And he was right. His problem was that he took the wrong side in the 19th century. If you transport yourself back to about the year uh, 1830 is a good starting point, it's a good year. There are two possible classes able to rule this country, two potential ruling classes. 
One was the established aristocracy, the established order of throne and altar and lords and commons. The other was a body of middle-class officials and professional men and general men of business. Now, if you look at the kind of England that the traditional order had presided over, you can see a vast mass of abuses. Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill both went through it. I've read their stuff on law reform. It is compelling. For example, under the old common law, if you wanted, uh, if you wanted legal redress, you would need to start an action in the court of King's Bench uh, for damages, and you would need to start a parallel action in the court of Chancery for an injunction. So if you wanted somebody to stop um, dumping rubbish in your garden, you would start an action in the, in the King's Bench Court uh, to get damages to compensate you for clearing the rubbish away, and you'd have to start an action in the Court of Chancery to get an injunction to stop him from dumping rubbish in the future. The cases would proceed at different speeds and on different evidence, and there were occasions when the King's Bench judges would rule against you and the Chancery judges in your favour. Uh, there was no organised system of appeal. If you wanted... Um, if you wanted rule, rules of conduct laid down for your case, rules regarding discovery and inspection of documents, you would go before a King's Bench master, and for various reasons, you would have to pay him a double fee. The criminal law was particularly disorganised. The general constitution of the country was disorganised. And Bentham looked at this and said, this is a mass of rubbish. It needs to be cleared away. And the people who've presided over this since the 1680s, and indeed the 1660s, they should be cleared away as well. And we should have a democratic constitution accompanying a general reform of the administration of this country. And, and so the case against the old order was that um, it presided over a mass of abuses. And some of these abuses were damaging in the most obvious way to life and property. You could be hanged for stealing goods worth more than one and sixpence. You could be hanged for damaging the stones on Westminster Bridge. You could be hanged for bigamy. You could be hanged for buggery. You could be hanged for, oh, so many things you could be hanged for. And Bentham and Mill and the General School were in favour of a rationalisation and a humanisation of the criminal law. What they didn't realize was that the ruling class we had in the 18, before 1830, the ruling class we had after the 1832 Reform Act, was structurally committed to a small state. Hello again. The ruling class was willing to defend a mass of abuses, but at the macro level, it was in favour of a limited state. The reason it was in favour of a limited state was that it was an aristocratic ruling class. You cannot multiply the numbers of an aristocracy without, um, without ruining its status as an aristocracy. When everyone is somebody, then no one's anybody. This is not to cause you harm, this is to do me good. Because it's often a bit more. <laughs> you are excused. <laughs> the, the aristocratic ruling class was not interested in expanding its numbers because any expansion of aristocratic numbers was to reduce the privileges accruing to any particular member of the aristocracy. It was also, it was also hostile to any expansion of the state because this would have transferred power from the hands of amateurs into the hands of salaried professionals who might have taken further action against the, uh, 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 against the position of the aristocracy. And, and so you can criticize the aristocratic government 
we had in this country after the 1660s on the grounds of the endless mass of abuses over which it willingly presided, but at the same time it believed structurally in a small and relatively passive state. The kind of people Mill wanted to rule the country, on the other hand, had no structural bias towards a modest state. Oh, they might in Mill's day have subscribed to various weak doctrines of economic laissez-faire, but uh, that was something that soon passed away. If you are an official in a department, you have no interest in limiting your numbers. You want more officials. And to justify more officials, you'll find more problems to solve. And when you find more problems to solve, you'll need more officials, because it means more salaries for you and your friends. It means higher status. It means an unlimited growth of government, a hunt for problems, real or alleged to solve, and an endless clamor for more funding so that you and your friends can solve those problems. That is the problem that we have faced during the past 150 years. And that is a problem which Mill helped to bring about. He believed that his educated, civilized middle class would simply humanize the British state and then preside over a smaller British state. What happened was that undoubtedly the British state was rationalized, undoubtedly was humanized. I, I would rather be I would rather be defendant in a trial even today than 150 years ago. 150 years ago, if you were accused of a felony, you were not allowed to defend you were not allowed to have counsels defend you in court. You had to defend yourself. You were not allowed to give evidence in your own defense. Um, there was no system of appeal from a conviction. The best you could do was hope that the judge would take pity on you and apply to the Home Secretary for a commutation or perhaps even a pardon. Uh, the British state is undeniably more rational and more humane than it was 150 and 200 years ago. At the same time, it is vastly larger and vastly more intrusive than it ever was. Uh, and that is, I think, Mill's main mistake. Mill looked at the criminal and civil law. He looked at the general administration of this country as it was under aristocratic government, and he demanded thoroughgoing reform of the law and the administration and the way in which our rulers got into power. What he didn't realize was that as soon as he got the reforms that he and his friends so desired, the breaks to the expansion and intrusiveness of the state would be taken off. And so Mill's essay on liberty is an enduring classic. In spite of everything, I would recommend it. If a young student were to come to me and say, I've heard about this libertarianism thing, what do you think I would read? What do you think I should read? I would not recommend anything by Ayn Rand. I would not recommend Rothbard's For a New Liberty. I would not recommend any modern text on libertarianism. I would give him a copy of John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty. I would say, read that from cover to cover and come back and see me when you've done so. In spite of that, and for all that I do greatly admire Mill, he and his friends, this is not done by a single man, he and his friends made a serious strategic mistake in the early, middle, and 19th century, and we are living with those mistakes at the moment. And so with those words, I would thank you for the great indulgence you've shown me, and uh, I, I will take any questions. Thank you much indeed. Questions or comments, criticisms? If Oliver, Sean, if you, if uh, Mill made this great mistake of going on the harm route for justifying state uh, intervention, what alternative 
could he have used? And what alternatives were there around at the time among philosophers? What alternative route would he have taken to the harm to Ali's group? Well, the old defense of liberty was that it was our birthright, a, a bundle of liberties which are our birthright. Natural rights. No, not natural no, rights. rights. Well, natural rights was an argument, but the main compelling argument in the 17th, 18th, and most of the 19th centuries was that liberty was the birthright of an Englishman, and there were certain things the government shouldn't do. It was not a very systematic uh, doctrine, but it was an effective one. My own preferred formulation is to avoid talking about harm, because the moment you say you know, government should only intervene to um, prevent harm to others. You can see people leaning forward, ready to break in, and, and explain that um, if someone next door is using a dildo, he's harming him, they're harming him. Um, it, it's best to avoid it. Even though, obvious, you know, obviously in this room... How is he using it? <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter. I think the presence of the batteries in it was enough for some... Not a hole in the wall, but... Yeah. No, all right. We, the we within these walls, as libertarians, can agree that uh, the only justification for using force against someone else is to prevent harm to others. Because we have a, a, a general consensus of, of what is meant by harm. It's just that when you try to make that into a general argument for, um, for communicating to the outside world, you do get people jumping forward with what we would think the most factuous definitions of harm, which, which can be confusing. Yeah. Mr. Lambert, yes. Mill's great mistake in that was that he was not rigorous enough mm. in defining harm. For example, defining it as physical harm as opposed to psychological harm or microaggressions or whatever. It could be. Um, I think. Oddly enough, I think you're taking a too restrictive view of harm. You, you see, if I come to you and say, um, buy these shares from me, I guarantee they'll go up by 2,000% by next Tuesday, and I walk away with your life savings and the shares become toilet paper next Tuesday, I have harmed you, and you do have, and you ought to have a cause of action against me. And so harm is surely more than the simple initiation of force. It, it involves a, a degree of fraud as well. Um, it, it is a difficult definition. It's, it, it seems to be kind of locked into a reciprocal relationship to what you were talking about before in terms of the expansion of a state mm. and identifying problems or even creating problems because there obviously becomes an incentive to expand the definition of harm, which is what we live under now, it's expanded definition. Yes, a, a massively <coughs> expanded definition, but it's something that you would expect to have happened. Exactly, it's part of the mechanics, part of the engineering, isn't it? Because mm. people can increase their own power, status, and authority, mm. their own fiefdoms within the system. Yeah. By expanding that definition, but you're pushing it leftwards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's only in the past 30 years that it's become utterly malign. But I suppose 30 years ago I might have said the same. It's only in the past 30 years it's become utterly malign. But um, uh, undoubtedly the state has expanded and become more oppressive during the past 150 years. Well, oh, uh, of course it's pointed out by many, and the, the, the harm uh, conception is what should we put into it? Mm. Uh, of course, many themselves spoke about harm to your interests. Now, it may be, I'm a legal scholar or historian, that interest has a particular meaning. Like, is it your property? Mm. Or was there a contract violated? Or something of that kind, I don't know. Um, but the danger with that is, as you've said, it can then be extended to such as, um, if a Japanese car producer produces a more popular car than mine, has, have I been harmed? Or have my interests been harmed? Yes. And of course, that's, that, that opens the door to almost any, any intervention of any kind. Yes. Or even not to be given a good enough education because the school wasn't a state one. Mm -hmm. 
but still, before they made the statements, they might think it would be better. And for a while, even in some areas, it might have been better. Yes. But that again is harming someone by not educating them to a standard they might have got otherwise. Mm. But, but going back to, to harm and the Japanese car manufacturers, there is no reasonable doubt that free trade harms certain people. It harms those people who would otherwise have businesses and jobs. And so does that mean that protectionism is justified? Now, our, our answer is no, of course not. It's just that um, if, you punch me in the, if you punch me on the nose, and um, if you punch me on the nose, I'll have a couple of hours of great discomfort and if you punch me hard enough, I might have six months of um, inconvenience. But if you invent a piece of machinery which abolishes the demand for my services, you cause me immense damage, far greater than simply punching me on the nose. And, and so on, on a headline reading of Mill's uh, simple principle, why do we have such strict laws against punching people on the nose, but it's open season on making my services redundant? But that is a problem. I think I would reply that it's the customers who desert you, who do you, in a sense, are, there, are ends in any um, loss you, you have, mm. not the fact that they've been offered a better product by someone else. Of mm. course, that's, that's the occasion, one, that's the further cause, the earlier cause, but, yes. but they simply no longer uh, make use of your goods, but that that cannot be a, a causing you harm. It looks better to blame it on the on the, the rival the rival producer, mm. but of course it's really the customers moving from you to somewhere else, and that, that can hardly be called harm. Otherwise, someone who turns down uh, an offer of marriage has harmed the chap concerned. Well, you might say that concerned. a refused offer of marriage can cause extreme harm to some people. How many times have you read about people who hang themselves because they were crossed in love? Pain and distress, yes. Yes. But not harm. <laughs> yes, I, I accept your argument. It's just that it's a difficult one yes. to give in a television studio. In a short uh, and that's where argument takes place nowadays. Yeah. When one boxer knocks another out, possibly puts him in a coma, even kills him, uh, he must have harmed him, but it was in a completely voluntaristic framework. Oh. Doesn't this show that harm has got nothing to do with it? We need a com completely different criteria. It might well be, yes. Though, though Mill would have responded to that, and I think most, well, actually not most people, most people would agree with you. Um, Mill would have responded that, in this case, the harm is consensual, therefore it doesn't come within his principle. But you see, you, you, you know, I, I do agree with you. It, anything that requires you to explain your terms weakens your argument, especially when you're facing people who are looking continually for chinks in your argument. Yes, what, what's your name, by the by? What's your name, by the by? Andre. 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 Oh, well, Andre. I, I would have a question on, on Richard Lentorism and Miller in particular because you mentioned humanism. And um, as I understand it, Miller is about also, in its core, about reducing the state to really be providing utility to all the systems and reducing it to that. Yeah. So, I mean, and then the, the humanism incorporates these days. Uh, Declaration of human rights, like for instance, the right to have work in all these international labor organizations in terms. So, what do you think? How can this anyway work together the humanism and its position? Is this not a strange way of putting things together? You mentioned this concept. My problem with humanism is that I don't know what it means. Um, now, okay, if you take the J.M. Robertson. <coughs> view of humanism, that it is, a, it is a concentration, it is a focus on promoting the happiness of people in this life, then yes, I agree with it. It's just that humanism is such a nice word that it was taken over a hundred years ago by the communists, and it has been systematically abused ever since by virtually any authoritarian who just doesn't happen to believe in God. 
So it, it's not a word that I would willingly use. I, I would never describe myself as a humanist, though according to some definitions, of course, we're all humanists in this room. Anyone else want to speak? But yes, what's your name, by the boy? Uh, Anthony van der Helst. Anthony. Um, apologies for my lateness. It was a Always talk. welcome. I really wanted to come. Always glad to see you, Anthony. Um, I wondered if I could broaden the historical context. Can you say anything about Mill's influence on the continental uh, European liberalism on one hand and uh, American and indeed other Anglo-Saxon uh, societies on the other? I'm not sure what influence Mill had on French or German liberalism. Obviously, he must have had some because he had an enormous influence on English liberalism in the 19th century, which would inevitably have fed into continental liberalism. Um, he's had a great influence on American libertarianism, at, at least before Rand and Rothbard. Um, what, what I can say about Mill's international influence most securely is that um, in the early and middle 19th century, the skeptical philosophy of David Hume was held at bay uh, by referring to the intuitionism of his Scottish critics, people like uh, John Reed. Mill's system of logic was a strong attack on the common sense school of philosophy. Uh, and so because of that, when, um, when in the late 19th century, idealistic philosophers tried to give a response to David Hume, they relied much more on Kant than they would have on Reed and Adam Smith and, and, and other Scottish uh, and native British or American philosophers. And so um, if you study philosophy to degree level nowadays in England or America, you do Locke, Berkeley, Hume, Kant. And, and that effectively is where it finishes, unless you go on to those rather strange um, French people. And many do. The hot air merchants. Um, and so Mill had a negative influence on British and American academic life. But his actual, the, the actual influence of liberalism, I don't know how much influence he had outside of England and the English-speaking world. But I should imagine that because of the position of England and the English-speaking world, it has been considerable. Well, just as it's funny, I one should mention, you know of Clary Hughes? No, tell me. Oh, Clary, you were a, a school chum of G.K. Chesterton. He's the one who invented the thing now called a Clary, who, which goes along these lines. Uh, uh, bug, uh, geography is about maps and biography is about chaps. He also produced John Stuart Mill, by a mighty effort of will, overcame his natural bonhomie and wrote Principles of Political Economy. Hugh was someone for whom the smell of bacon, though steadfast, need not presage breakfast. <laughs> and there are, there are quite a few more. But uh, we haven't mentioned the great work, and I don't know how much Manchesterism, as the Germans still insultingly call it, well, it's not insulting. Well, for London to be taken for Manchester might be regarded as an insult, but uh, for shorthand purposes, Manchesterism is laissez faire yeah. mm. capitalism. Also, little in England, though. Well, definitely. Another one. So um, th that that's all part of the mix. You couldn't touch on everything, but of course, but that's mm. that's another great influence of uh, well, though of course not his own liberty, but of course it went with and through his uh, his own liberty. Uh, some have said that he, he sort of let the side down later by becoming an art fond of co <coughs> uh, cooperatives and uh, and um, gas boards that shared the that shared the profits and things, but of course he um. These are Canberra experiments in living. But he, he, didn't, he didn't think they should be nationalised anyway, or municipalised even, I don't think. No. He, but he, he, he certainly approved of the idea of having uh, profit-sharing companies and cooperatives. Hmm? He certainly, certainly believed in that. 
But does anyone in this room disagree with uh, voluntary cooperatives and profit sharing? No. I, I would go further and um, say that the that the Companies Acts of the 19th century were a very serious legis legislative mistake and that um, at least comparable with the evils that we suffer from an extended state are the evils of limited liability and the large faceless corporations that they have spawned. And so in that sense, I would, um, I, I would regard Mill as a kindred spirit. So long as it doesn't involve um, state power, there is nothing morally wrong with socialism. Is someone film saying that? <laughs> well, there's socialism and there's socialism. There is indeed, yes. I mean, uh, a libertarian society is more than Tesco minus the state, isn't it? Yeah. Not that I would not Tesco. Within the context in which it operates, Tesco is one of the benefactors of humanity. But libertarianism is more than simply um, Tesco. No, it's liabilities. Um, and it's interesting in the context of Miller, I guess, um, the, all this expansion of international trade and the chemical industry, particularly from Germany before the First World War, and then uh, the multinational companies, and uh, after the Second World War, particularly techno high technology. Mm -hmm. uh, this wouldn't be uh, happen without liabilities, without, without banks backing all these big companies. So, in this kind of real liberalism, libertarian economies, let's say, what would anyway be happening with globalization and global trade? Is this not? Well, how, how does the vision of growth, or is growth to be unimportant for the libertarian sovereign? I, I suspect that you're falling into the trap identified by Bastiat of what is seen and what is not seen. Now, there, there have been considerable benefits from globalization and from the international division of labor. But globalization and the international division of labor as it, has, as it currently exists is very much based on state power. <coughs> it may well be, indeed I believe it would be the case, that uh, if we had not, if we were not living in a world of state-backed globalization, we would be living in a world of interlocking but small communities, which would which may not have developed certain technologies which have been carried to great perfection in our own age, but um, which would be enriched by other technologies. Well, it's difficult... Hmm? Because I don't... Well, because I haven't seen them, I don't know what they are. Yeah, yeah. But as I said, I, I refer to Bastiat, what is seen and what is not seen. Any state action unless we're talking about Soviet Russia, any state action will produce benefits. And the benefits are solid and undeniable. The problem is that they bring certain costs, and we're not always able to identify what those costs are. And I would suggest that the current international order of state-backed international division of labor is not the best system conceivable. Though it works well enough, I must confess. But we are, libertarianism is utopian or it is nothing. And I do want better than we have. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Sean, for that talk. Uh, very interesting. I, I don't know if you know this, but today is World Information Technology Day, which everyone's <laughs> 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 yeah. So appropriately, you got the uh, mill there. Mm. Um, <laughs> I'm honest with you. A lot of what you said went completely over my head. <laughs> I mean, 
it, it's a dangerous thing. You should sit up in your chair. Oh, this is the best policy path. Um, you know, it's interesting. I wonder, uh, I mean, when you look at uh, libertarianism, and uh, in a historical context, of course, it's uh, I mean, what went on in history is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, I, I believe at Mill's time, they put animals in a court and actually question animals, educated people. Not in Mill's time, but somewhat earlier. Maybe just a little bit yes. before. Not that long before. Hmm. But you can always, I mean, you can always look back in history and laugh. I, I, I dare say that people will look back at our time in 200, 300 years' time and, and laugh at what we're doing now. I love it enough. Um, you know, th things change with fashion. Mm -hmm. and, but one of the great things about uh, liberty, libertarianism, and uh, people's freedom and identity today is it's all wrapped up, uh, a lot of it's wrapped up with religion. And I wonder what, uh, how Mill's religion or religious teachings reflected on, on his idea of liberty. I mean, the fact is that whatever you, uh, religions you look at, and, and there are many, many thousands of religions in the world today, and from a strictly libertarian position, they're, they're all mad. <laughs> Let's be honest about it. Every, every, every single one of them is mad. Yes. But from, from a strictly libertarian position, there's no question. But Mill was obviously brought up in a very religious society. And how did that reflect on his religious thinking? That, that's the first thing I, I, I want to ask. There's a, there's a second thing I want to ask you, but, but I, I'd like you to answer that. Oh, very briefly then. Mill. Um... Mill's father, James Mill, spent a while as a, as a dissenting minister, but was probably never more than a vague sort of deist. Uh, Mill, certainly by the time he was a mature adult, was a thoroughgoing atheist. Mill had no religious beliefs, whatever. And wrote a lot on philosophy. But he, would have been, he, he wrote, wrote a lot on philosophy. Was quite religious. Oh. But yeah, someone else now, Pat, you've had one question. Does anyone else want to talk? Well, I guess all right, Pat. Second question. Yeah. <laughs> Pat, you can answer that one. Yeah. Um, with, with, with the idea of open borders today and mass immigration and the idea of, uh, of libertarianism as a culture, mm -hmm. as a culture, how would you think Mill would uh, respond to the challenges we have? Okay. Open borders are, as far as libertarians are concerned, an open issue. There, there are some libertarians who believe that there should be no border controls of any kind. There should be no state, and if there is no state, there will be no borders, and therefore the question doesn't arise. People will simply move to wherever they please in the world, so long as they can find somewhere to live and somewhere to work. So there would be no culture? There, no, no, there are other libertarians who are concerned about the overall effects of unlimited immigration uh, on a on an imperfectly libertarian culture. Most cultures that have existed and most cultures that do exist are not particularly libertarian. And it could well be that by allowing the free movement of people from less libertarian cultures to more libertarian cultures, you will end up with a less libertarian world. Now, you know, this is an open question, and it's something that um, should be discussed with moderation and some degree of mutual respect. Well, that's all I'll say at the moment. So is there anyone else? Ah, oh, Anthony. Um, I want to ask a question from an, an objectivist position. Um, you are, of course, extremely familiar with uh, Ayn Rand's concept of the standard value. Is it possible to detect uh, a standard or standards of value of that type in Mill? And would Mill have 
been able, found it more easy to define harm had he, for example, adopted Ayn Rand's uh, position that life itself is the standard of value. Mill was a radical empiricist. He would have dismissed Ayn Rand out of hand had he lived long enough to read her. Um, Mill was aware of the natural rights branch of libertarianism. Of course he was. But he had no particular respect for it. He, um, he was, in that degree, a thoroughgoing Benthamite. And when Bentham discussed natural rights in the 18th century, he called them nonsense on stilts. Where are these natural rights, he asked. Can I touch them? So I don't believe Ayn Rand had very much respect for John Stuart Mill. I, I would be very surprised if she had said anything flattering about the man, and he would have dismissed her as a silly, hysterical woman. <laughs> oh, no, no, he was a very feminist, wasn't he? It didn't mean that... Uh, he, he was like, there, are, there, are, there are women and women. He didn't take my position on Rand. He was like her as an independent woman. We didn't think she uh, ought to uh, develop an interest in philosophy a bit more. And of course, John Asper has tried to get her interested in philosophy, but uh, it was... Uh, a vain. I mean, she didn't like thinking going around. That's the thing she hated most of all. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm not a Randian by any means, but uh, Ayn Rand was a good writer, and what she said about modern art was entirely to the point, in my view. I'm, I'm not a Randian, but I admire Ayn Rand as a person, and some of her writings are well worth reading. I was curious, sir, have you read um, Mencius Mulberg at all? Um, his yes. views on progressivism as a, neo, as a sort of mm. non theistic Christian sect. Yeah. I, 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 I do know many people who are in what's called the alternative right, and they do have some interesting perspectives. My difference from them, indeed, perhaps our difference from them, is that is that we are we are scientific rationalists? We believe that the whole world is a gigantic treasure house, which is open for us to use exactly as we please to improve our understanding of and control over nature, to promote our own interests. Now most alternative rightists do not take that particular point of view. Uh, they like the idea of more organic societies. They are skeptical about the value of progress in itself. Moldbug has, no, has a number of interesting points. Uh, what, what I particularly... One issue over which I particularly disagree with them is that they have no time for constitutional government. They do believe in a more or less unfettered hereditary uh, despotism o on the grounds that it's more honest than the system we have and probably in the longer term more consistent with the promotion of human interests. But um, I, I do like the idea of a balanced liberal constitution. But yes, I've read Nordberg. Mm. I, I've read Nick Land. I've read oh, I've read many people on the alt right, and I do read them. And they're intelligent men; they're worth reading. But um, I wouldn't go as far as saying specifically. I do you see any value in the idea of progressivism, sort of the, the modern left as a as a as a religion? No, no. The, no, the modern left is trash. Um, and the problem is that they have taken perfectly decent words like progress, humanism, uh, liberalism, and turned them into uh, things which we must reject with scorn, which is a great shame because they're fine words. They're, they're words which express what most of us do believe. I mean, is there anyone here who doesn't believe in progress? Anyone who thinks that progress is in any sense bad. There is, a, there is such a thing as a race progress. Yes. Downhill. Yes. 
But uh, I, I like living at the moment. I, I, I like my computer. I like my telephone. I like my webcam. I like the um, I like the glass fibre rods that keep the crowns in my mouth. I, 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 I like modernity. Um, it's just that words like progress, modernity, uh, democracy, human rights, liberalism, that they've all been taken over one after the other yes. by some thoroughly bad people. Uh, and turned into expressions of malignancy. Henri? Yeah, Henri. Uh, I, I think um, if you think of Adam Smith and the last nations, what was all about growth of the nation and, and more prosperity and in terms of growth. And, um, and then the modern capitalistic state and the state quite heavy and regulated. It's so largely a growth or communistic is about this, mm -hmm. having a fair distribution. But what, what about Mill? What would you say, just being interested, what was the future directive of Mill? What was the positive future? What, what, was, what was Mill's philosophy heading for in terms of direction and, and developing the society? Mill's ideal future was considerably richer than his own day, but it was also much nicer. Um, Mill accepted that the industrial civilization of 19th century England was enriching the country. But he was not blind to the great inequalities of wealth. He was not blind to the often miserable condition of the workers. He did not want to, he did not want to change that society by some Leninist scheme of nationalizing the means of production, distribution, and exchange. He was hoping that a spontaneous growth of humanity and um, a, a number of legal reforms would, would gradually make the world a nicer and more charitable and a more equal place. And I, I wouldn't dissent from that wish. As I said earlier, I have no objection whatsoever to profit-sharing, cooperatives, um, any kind of voluntary association between people. What's your name, by the way? Daniel. Daniel. Yeah. Do you see any sort of clash between liberalism, as understood as classical liberalism, and democracy? <coughs> well, traditionally, um, yes, there has always been a clash between liberalism and democracy. Liberalism is something believed in by educated middle-class people with white collars, and democracy is the power of the great unwashed. It, it, it's just that I, I do not believe that there is this necessary disjunction between the two. As I said earlier, most of the bad things that have happened in the past century or so were not demanded by the people. They were demanded by small, organized minorities who claimed they were acting in the name of the people. If we were to have a perfect democracy in this country, if, if for example, no, let's imagine that uh, every person in this country could vote on every single law that was made uh, and could elect every single official it would probably be a more libertarian place. I'm skeptical of that, personally. Um, do you think that the great majority of people in this country believe in the war on drugs? I don't think so. Do you think most people in this country get worked up uh, because uh, someone's looking at violent pornography on a computer? I don't think so. Do you, it really depends on the cultural climate, though, doesn't it? Yes, it does. If you've got a politically really correct climate or super nationalistic climate mm. that can overturn certain key aspects of materialism. Yes, it could. But you see, if you live in that kind of culture, libertarianism is unlikely to have much influence in any event. That's kind of... You can take their votes away, but their voices will still be heard at some level. I, I think that a perfect democracy, in, in the way I've just uh, defined it, would probably be more libertarianism in most respects than the system in which we live now. Oliver? You say that um, the upper classes at the time um, have more of an insight as to what the state would become. 
I think it was Lord Acton or someone who was it, well, opposed to Robert Peel's introduction to the, what the Peelers, the, the, the police, police and said, we're making a sort of, this, is, this will end badly. I can't remember the exact quote. Lord Eldon. Eldon. Yeah, he said, touch one atom and the whole is smashed. Um, he, he said that if you, if you allow, if you allow people charged with felony mm -hmm. to have um, legal counsel for their defence, the, the entire, the entire existing order will fall to the ground. Now, that, that would have been um, a somewhat unlikely proposition, but on the whole, he was right. Um, but wasn't he the one that opposed the police force as well? So we're yes. A body to sort of come oh, yes. and yes. arrest us. Yes. Given that now, if the, what you mentioned earlier, the satanic verses were, mm. were written out just now, he could well be arrested. I mean, there was a yes. there was an owner of a dog arrested in Scotland mm. for teaching his dog. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And All dogs do that. <laughs> and it's very po face yeah. big inspector. Big. Yeah. Um, Cockburn, who said, well, you've caused offence to some minority, this is very serious. And Don't forget the young man who suggested that the police force looked a bit gay <laughs> and got an ASBO for it. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you're... Um, no. The die-hard high Tories of the 1820s and 30s were utterly opposed to the creation of any kind of state policing and uh, would have joined with us in calling them the pigs, the filth, the scum. Did they foresee something? Because Mill is the sort of cult of the experts, mm. who believe that yeah. these educated middle classes would be able to. Yes. Um, they didn't obviously share that, they weren't in the same class, and they were sceptical of any kind. They were. Some of them, some of the Tories believed that if you gave ordinary people the vote, it would lead to a slow motion uh, French terror of 1793, the people who elect demagogues who would kill anyone with a decent coat on his back. Other conservatives were more sophisticated in their, in their analysis. They thought that it would lead to the empowerment of a malign bureaucracy, and, and they turn out to be in the right ones. Well, I was about to make, make the point about the French having another foreign government having an organised police force and uh, show us why we shouldn't have one. Uh, but that's the point that's had to be made. Mm. So we'll now move on to a point I can no longer remember. Uh, you shouldn't have left the room. <laughs> <laughs> but, or, yeah, yeah, in that case, um, I was just yeah. going to say about the, the idea of giving everyone democracy and that everyone votes on the, 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 the route you went down there. I mean, that, that's kind of going down the route of anarchy. There's a big, big difference shame, between shame. Between, yeah, I mean, society wouldn't function if you were anarchy. It's the opposite. Democracy is the, the opposite of anarchy. Well, democracy I... is totalitarian government, mm. and anarchy is no government. So democracy is one extreme, and anarchy is the other extreme. If you let everyone uh, do as they want, I mean, you would have anarchy. If you had no government, our, you'd have anarchy. In our case, the, the rule of law mm. to, to uh, it, it, it's a but, but, uh, that I mean, you, you know, it's, it's where we draw the line. That's, I, I would suggest that one of the big problems, practical problems we have today, I don't know how Mill would uh, reflect on this, but in the division between civil law and criminal law, which is a big problem today, and other things which went on, for example, th things which are addressed in, in, in academia or in the media. That is things like, for example, local government, where you have, you've always had the idea of the separation of church and state for a, a long period in British history. But when you have local government today, you haven't got that separation. And that separation is very important. It hasn't been recognised that a separation doesn't apply in local government. You have not got separation of church and state in the British state. Church of England. You've got a separation of church and state in America. You do have a separation to a certain extent. But when you come down to... No, no, you're Church of England. You don't have that. Church of England is national church. The Church of England is no longer effectively the church. The church has shifted. 
Well, well you, 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 I'm just talking to you right here. Yeah, you might you might argue that the Church of England is not as powerful as it used to be. Anyhow, yeah, I should shut up on the chair. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I, no, no, we're having a general discussion. Sorry, I, I, I'm not um, I, I'm not the sun in the room to which you all turn your faces for illumination. <laughs> well, yeah, but you're the guest speaker, so you. Oh yes. Yeah, so, 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 but I mean, I've, I've I've been here for an hour and a half, and surely. I've outstayed my welcome, so... No, uh, I don't think so. Can, can I ask me... Yeah, yeah, we, 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 uh, we, 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 we are declining into... A, we might as well continue the discussion in the... Yes, in, I think so. Uh, 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 a drink or two in the bar. Will that be the last question? No. No, no the last question's gone. <laughs> <laughs> you just missed the last train. This is the last question. No, it isn't. <laughs> what would Bill... What would Bill <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. What would Bill say... And I hope you come next month. Yes. <laughs> the next train. Uh, but uh, can we have another applause for uh, a very good question? <laughs>